Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the session titled, Manila Share Does Not Simply Move and Protect Itself. Oh, wait, it does. I'm Rodrigo Barbieri. I'm a core developer in the project Manila, and I'm a driver developer for Itachi Data Systems. Hi, and I'm Gautam. I work for NetApp. I'm an OpenStack contributor. I'm also the API working group liaison for Manila. Uh, today, the storage is one of the most important pieces that comprises any cloud, which in turn must provide indispensable properties like 24-7 uh, availability. Uh, it's a major concern that uh, it, the hardware and software uh, that comprises any cloud uh, is able to offer uh, always on uh, availability. So when you have this uh, hardware and software that needs to offer uh, availability, you'd like to test them over and over again to make sure that these disaster recovery mechanisms are fail safe and they're, and they're most importantly reliable. So one of, the easy, one of the things that we'd like to provide is the ease of performing switchovers and switchbacks, failovers and failbacks any number of times, right? And this determines how, this determines how uh, you know, resilient your cloud is in the face of any failures and how amenable it is to any maintenance and life cycle operations. Um, in several cases, administrators uh, have to develop and perform maintenance on several complex scripts in order to, to maintain, uh, protect, recover, and move data in order to minimize downtime. And so when you have a cloud that's running multiple storage vendors, right? So, and you, you, you know that this vendor is running SnapMirror and this vendor can do recovery point and this, this is how you move data for this vendor and this is how you move data for this other vendor. But what happens when you want to move data from this vendor storage to this other vendor storage, right? And there's also this concept of, oops, sorry. I'm a little messed up with my slides today. Okay, so there's also this concept of being, uh, I mean, managing all of these without having to worry about all of these uh, intricacies that go with specific storage systems. So many a times cloud administrators are probably going to switch to slower and more inefficient ways of talking to all of their cows with the same language. So in heterogeneous clouds that, is, that are running uh, storage from different vendors, these scripts become even more complex because they have to, uh, maintain and provide interoperability between those different storage vendors. Okay, next. One of the solutions is using Manila, a uh, multi-vendor storage abstraction that works. So for many releases, uh, cloud operators have tried and experienced the simplicity that OpenStack Manila brings to their clouds, right? The, the self-service storage abstraction that, that abstracts away all of the complexities that, that, that you have to deal with individual storage vendors, right? Many, many clouds are just one storage vendor. That's all right, but that's still dealing with uh, having to write APIs, API calls to these storage vendors. And the service architecture that Manila has is something that cloud operators are already familiar with. That it has, this, it has an API, it has a scheduler, it has multiple managers. It talks to a database, it talks to a message through a message queue, and so on. So what Manila can bring to you, and what Manila has been bringing to you, is reducing all of this backend storage complexity and delivering all of these features that you still care about through a consistent and a restful API. Uh, Manila allows making use of several vendor-specific features by mapping these features and their backends to share types. Uh, it also allows the creation of shared file systems, access rules, creating snapshots, and deleting snapshots, and many other operations. So now let's switch gears and uh, discuss an important feature that we added in uh, Manila in the recent releases. We're calling this shared replication. So there are several approaches to increasing data availability in your clouds, right? So in the face of hardware, software, or even site failures. So mirroring provides a mechanism that it, you can facilitate this data availability across multiple availability zones. And that's the concept that Manila is trying to bring to OpenStack for shared file systems. 
Failure is definitely lurking in your data centers, whether it is you know, loss of power, failure because of loss of cooling, or there's, there's been a calamity, there's been network connectivity loss, or there is just an operator error at the end of the day. So one of the biggest features that this feature can bring to your clouds is data protection for the specific use case of disaster recovery. Of course, there are other use cases for replication that we'd like to solve, right? Such as you're, you might be mirroring your data for other use cases, such as creating these data stores that would allow you to, uh, to have continuous data, uh, application development by using your mirrors. Or you could be maintaining, you, you could be load balancing your reads on your uh, replicas, uh, I mean, on your source shares by, by directing some of the reads to your replicas, right? And there's also the, the, the concept of reducing any performance latencies by totally turning off the reads on your source share, having uh, only your output directed to your source share and reading off the replicas for any test and dev uh, sort of use cases. So replication in Manila is designed to solve these use cases, and it has three different flavors that we expose through the REST API, DR, readable, and writable. DR stands for disaster recovery. It's for so, solely the purpose of disaster recovery. Therefore, your replicas are managed by Manila safely until after a, a disaster has occurred. That is, they are not exported. No one sees them. You know they exist, but you, they are not exported until after a disaster has occurred. Readable, on the other hand, right? We, 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 when you create a replica, we export the replica as well. So you can go ahead and mount the replica. And you can start reading from the other replica. But of course, write operations are disallowed on any secondary replicas that are there. And writable is meant to allow simultaneous writes, right? You, you have a, uh, I mean, you can think of this as a clustered share where you, you probably want to write from multiple clients and you want to synchronously replicate between them. And Manila makes that possible as well. F today, we have driver support for two of the three ki kinds of these replication flavors that we have. We support DR and readable today in code. And for this first party driver support for readable type of replication. Yes, it's limited in, this, in the sense of being driven by Manila as such, and uh, we have plans of improving it. One other use case that we currently don't support is the, is the one with shared servers, and we have plans of adding that very soon. So one of the most attractive, attractive features that share replication in Manila specifically brings to you is that this is enabled on your tenants, for your tenants, right? So these, this feature is visible to your tenants. So users can actually go ahead and manage their replicas as well as they're managing their uh, shares currently. So this allows for users to write applications that are aware of their d disaster protection, uh, sorry, data protection strategies and so on. Of course, you don't need to consult the administrator. We're taking away one, uh, one more level of in interaction over there to talk to your own replicas and so on. And you can test your disaster recovery strategy by fail per performing any number of failovers and failbacks. So we, we create this ring of replicas, and you can always fail over and fail back. And you can, you can test this even before you actually go uh, hit that disaster someday. Manila also ensures that both your data and associated snapshots of a given share are replicated to the destinations. And you can definitely always continuously monitor the health of these replicas as you uh, see them. So when working with share replication in Manila, one of the most important design considerations that we kept in mind was the fact that we'd have to interoperate with the, the concept of availability zones across your OpenStack ecosystem. Right, so availability zones in Manila are still tenant visible, and they can, they, they can manage and control their shared file systems alongside their compute, their network, and block storage. To help cloud administrators, however, gain one other level of uh, granularity in determining what backends can they configure for replication, right? You can have 10 different kinds of storage systems in your, uh, in your cloud, right? And you'd want to expose the goodness of these storage systems. And you know that this storage system can replicate, uh, and you're going to be configuring this storage system to replicate with this other storage system and so on. So we introduce the concept of a replication domain. So it's a configuration parameter which you could, you, you could basically have, uh, I mean, you can configure two different storage systems to be part of a replication domain. That just means that they are going to replicate data between each other. And that if, if storage systems can't replicate to, to each other, they're not going to be part of the same replication domain. Of course, these replication domains are not tenant visible. So let me take you through an example use case for share replication. 
Uh, I'll be using the replication support that we added to the Manila UI plugin in Newton. And uh, we will begin with this architecture. So we have a cloud. We have two availability zones. Right uh, On this slide, I've called them AZ1 and AZ2. But in my example, uh, they're going to be called Barcelona and Madrid. And we're going to, let's say we have a NetApp backend in AZ1 and another NetApp backend in AZ2. And we, we know they're going to be set up for mirroring. So we're going to configure them in the same replication domain. And our use case for Man the Manila share in this example is to uh, run an enterprise's logging strategy, right? So it's, it, we're, we're going to be using the Elk Stack Elasticsearch log, log stash in Kibana to show you this. So let's begin. See that? Yes, you can. All right, so let's log into the uh, Horizon UI and create a share. This has been sped up a little bit. And we're going to pick up a share type that can support replication. And we're going to create our share in this availability zone. And it's a configured availability zone called Barcelona. And let's go ahead and create this share. And let's allow access to this share to the client that we're going to mount the share at. Right? So it's as easy as saying, OK, add an access rule. It's an IP access rule. This client can do reads and writes on this access rule. That's my client IP. And Let's go back to the share and pick up its export location. And let's go into our client, which is this one here. And let's mount this share. Let me mount it to this mount point called logs. This is because I'm going to store my logs in this uh, mount point. It's mounted right now. Let me go ahead, create a couple of folders in this mount point. I'm going to call it a, lo a folder for logs and a folder for indices. Right, so I'm going to pipe all my logs into this logs folder, and I'm going to maintain my Elasticsearch indices in the index folder. So I'm going to just run a script to pull all these logs from my CI, because I have no application that can generate a volume of logs like this. That's my CI system's logs being piped. And I'm going to start running uh, log stash. Let's take a look at the configuration. That's my uh, mount point, and it's configured to the CI logs folder. And my output is going to Elasticsearch. It's running off the same machine on that port. So let's go back. Let's look, take a look at what Elas where Elasticsearch is putting its indices. Again, it's called data node, I suppose, or path.data. Yeah, there it is. So I'm going to point my log folder, index folder at that. So that's where Elasticsearch is going to put all of its indices. So let's go ahead and start Elasticsearch and start, start stashing our logs. Now, since we've redefined this, I'm just going to use log stash off the command line like that. And when you do start stashing your logs, you're going to see the output. I have not piped the output, so you can see that brilliantly go up and down there. All right, so let's go into the UI that we have configured for this. It's called Kibana. And let's just perform some simple queries on this, right? So looking at logs for the last seven days, and let's just look at all the errors that could have happened. Well, that's our CI, so obviously there are a lot of errors that we intentionally caused. And uh, let's make, make a little more, uh, you know, uh, a, a little more complex of a query. We're just saying, give me all the no valid host errors, where all the Marla scheduler failed to find a valid host. About 33 hits, not bad. That means we have to write more tests. OK. And then we go back to our UI at this point, and let's create a replica. It's as simple as going back to the UI and saying, all right, create me a replica. Here, uh, my share is in Barcelona, so let's create a replica in Madrid. At this point, I'm going to pause because I'm going to talk about what we are going to do after this uh, replica is created. Right, so this replica starts out in its in out of sync status. It's going to start syncing from the source share. At this point, we probably have about gigabytes of some logs that, that, are, that are getting piped and stuff. And it's, once it starts syncing, it's going to continue on some sort of a cron schedule. That's, what, that's all backend dependent. Manla is not handling that. But Manla is letting you know that this, this syncing process is in sync or out of sync. Out of sync meaning there's something that could have gone wrong and you know, it's not being updated. And we, we regularly poll for the health of these replicas. To simulate a disaster, I'm going to bring down my data center. Not by doing anything, uh, this thing, but actually by just pausing the NFS service on the uh, source backend. So let me go in, right, let's wait for the uh, replica to go in sync. And let me go into the uh, 
system manager and disable the NFS service. So this is a disaster, right? My logs have stopped stashing, everything is stopped, and then Kibana tells me, oops, can't connect to Elasticsearch, I'm down, right? So logs have all gone, end of the world. Let's go ahead and promote our replica. It's as simple as saying, set this replica as active. And there we are. We start doing it, and Manala uh, sets this share into a replication change. You can't do anything to the share while it's in the replication change. Let's pick up the new export location that gets generated. And that's log stash puking all over my screen. Let's go back and unmount the old uh, replica. Let's do this a little gracefully. And let's go ahead and mount the new share. Of course, all of this will be scripted in your environments. I'm just typing them out for ease of use. And let's look into this mount folder. Of course, I'm not going to validate each and every uh, thing is there. But of course, uh, we're going to start stashing the logs again. We'll see how that works. We have our logs. We have our index uh, folder. So all right. And then we will go back and we'll start the log stash uh, thing again. So we, have, we, know, we, we know our source is still writing. So we, we can just go ahead and stash it. So pointer at the config file. Log stash picks up where it stopped. And there we go again. At this point, let's pull, pull up the uh, user interface. Boom, it's back. So indexes are all fine and healthy. Let's just search for something. These are all the times that Manila actually created a share. 520 to 25 times. Not. All right, so that was how simple it is to use share replication through the UI. It's not showing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> OK. Uh, yep. Let's talk a bit about share migration now. Uh, share migration is a feature that allows an administrator to migrate a share from a, a storage pool to another storage pool. So, uh, in which cases uh, does share migration come in handy? Well, whenever uh, the administrator is uh, optimizing a hardware, uh, tagging end of line, perform, taking down for maintenance, uh, optimizing, loading, balancing, uh, the, the share migration feature can migrate any share contained within to another, another storage. Um, the, the user may also, uh, may also, uh, it's the previous one, okay. Mm -hmm. The user may, may, may also want the, sh the share to be closer to his location for better performance. So that's, that's another use case. And uh, better yet, share migration allows uh, the administrator to migrate a share from one vendor storage hardware to another uh, storage hardware from an, a different vendor. Uh, so with, with share migration co comes its own uh, benefits and challenges. And uh, w whenever uh, the administrator is trying to perform a share migration, uh, it may be necessary to change certain properties that are, uh, are, are available in Manila, such as driver modes, uh, share network, share type, and availability zones. And uh, the, in, in order to migrate your share to your destination of, of choice. And the share migration API allows the administrator to change these properties when, ch when performing a migration. Uh, also, uh, share migration uh, may, uh, performing a migration may disconnect some users that uh, are connected to, to the share. And uh, that's uh, why we designed it, uh, this feature to be, uh, to have a two-phase approach. One phase is the one that copies files, and the other one that uh, we call cutover phase, it deletes the source shares and, and uh, uh, perf perform uh, export location updates and network paths and updates, thus uh, di di possibly disconnecting the clients. Uh, Two flavors of migration are supported. One is the driver-assisted migration, where the vendors can expose their uh, advantages, such as uh, more, ad more efficient ways of migrating shares, and uh, a host-assisted migration that uh, is able to provide, uh, to provide 
uh, the capability of migrating shares from a vendor to another vendor. So this is what an administrator would see uh, when clicking the uh, migrate share button. And uh, here we could see that uh, the first field to input is the destination pool field. And uh, then we have uh, four parameters. The first one is to force a host assisted migration, uh, which is best suited when uh, it is uh, migrating from, uh, uh, sorry, uh, migrating across different vendors. And the other three parameters are, uh, are used for the driver assisted migration in order for a vendor to perform uh, a share that, uh, sorry, a migration that remains writable during the whole migration. Uh, also, the capability to preserve all uh, uh, file metadata during migration, and uh, also to do so non disruptively. And uh, we also see two uh, drop down lists in order to select uh, new share networks and new share types that may need to be changed in order to migrate your share to your destination of choice. So when the, you, the, the administrator clicks starts, starts migration, uh, it will start the first phase. In this phase, the share remains accessible and uh, the, it, may, it may be accessible only in read-only mode, depending on whether the, the driver supports a writable migration or the host assisted flavor is used. Uh, this, this phase is also cancelable which means that uh, the administrator can go and, and decide to cancel this migration because uh, it may take a very long time, uh, hours or days, depending on the amount of data. And uh, he can also uh, uh, obtain the progress of migration so he can have uh, uh, an idea of how long it's going to take to complete. Uh, and then, uh, after the, the, data, the data copy phase is complete, uh, we proceed to the cutover phase. This phase is expected to be disrupted, but it may not be if, uh, if a vendor is able to, to implement a non-disruptive migration. And then depending on the circumstances, like the same storage pool or same backend or different availability zones, uh, this, this phase separation in is, order, is implemented like this in order to uh, provide the convenience to the administrators to choose the, the best moment to, to trigger this phase in order to minimize downtime. Uh, so what magic is that that can uh, migrate shares between different storage vendors? Well, it's no magic. It's just a, um, automat a data service, a dedicated data service that works like an automatized administrator. It mounts the source and destination shares and copies data over. Um, it's be best, uh, it offers best performance when uh, deployed uh, standalone and on a, on a single, single server. So it does not disrupt the, the, other, the other services that are running the drivers or API or scheduler. Now uh, we are going to demonstrate uh, a migration between two different uh, storage vendors. One that is the generic backend using the generic driver uh, provided in uh, Manila. And uh, the other one is the Itachi HNAS backend. Okay. Start. So let's log into our OpenStack dashboard uh, as an administrator and let's see which shares we have. We can see that we have a, a share created in the generic backend. It already contains uh, an access rule which provides access to a guest uh, virtual machine. Let's copy the export location and mount it on our guest virtual machine. So we can see that we already have uh, 800 megabytes uh, file in there. Let's create a dump file just to demonstrate that the share is writable at this moment. So let's trigger a migration. Uh, can you please pause? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So l let's fill here, here the destination, destination uh, pool 
uh, string. That's where we want to migrate the share to, the HNS backend. Here we're going to select the first host assisted migration because we're doing a migration between different storage vendors. And deselect the other ones because those are only for driver assisted. Now we are going to deselect the share network set as empty. And uh, we are going to choose the share type uh, compatible with the destination. This is in order to change the driver mode. Okay, so we have just triggered a migration. We can see that the status uh, changes to migrating. Let's try to obtain its progress. Since migration has just started, uh, it shows uh, it's at 0%. Uh, while it's migrating, let's do something else. Uh, let's try uh, to see if the contents are already there. Uh, are, are there, preserved, great. Uh, let's try to create another dummy file. We will see that it's not possible because for the host assisted migration, uh, writable migrations are not supported and then the share becomes writable, uh, sorry, readable. Let's try to obtain the progress again. Now we can see that it's at 100%. So let's trigger uh, migration complete. But before that, let's unmount our share gracefully. Okay, let's trigger complete migration. All right, we can see now that it shows that the share is in the HNAS backend. And uh, we can see that the export location has changed and it has migrated the access rules as well. So we do not have to migrate them all manually. Uh, let's copy the export location and mount the share again. So we can see that the contents are there. The dummy file that we created uh, has been migrated. We can create another dummy file here. So the share uh, has become writable after the migration. Um, now let's do something, uh, let's do another experiment. Let's try migrating back this, this share to the generic one. So let's go back to the list of shares and click Migrate Share. We're going to input the, the pool of the generic backend. Again, select first and host assisted, deselect the other ones. But now we have to choose a share network because the driver mode of the generic backend requires using a share network. And we will also uh, change the share type to be compatible. Okay, we successfully started the migration. Let's try to obtain progress. Right now is at, should be at 0%. And uh, for the interest of time, this video has uh, been sped up at this moment, so we will be taking progress again and see that right now it's at 100%. Let's trigger migration complete then. Okay. So it says that the share, the migration has been completed and uh, the share is now back in the generic backend uh, with a new export location, the same access rules. Let's mount it again. And we can see that the data has been transferred back along with the file that we created in the HNS backend. So we have all files there with all their content. That's it <laughs> for the share migration. Awesome. 
So uh, now that we've gotten you acquainted with uh, the work we've, that we've done so far, let, let, let me present to you a prototype of something that, that's going to be part of a future release, non-disruptive data motion. So Manila is poised to expose the goodness of backing storage in terms of providing non-disruptive operations to the tenants of your cloud. So in this example, we'll be using a Manila share to run some live workla workloads. And while those workloads are running, we're going to be moving that share from one storage pool to another storage pool. The workload that we will be running, interestingly, is your OpenStack instances, that is Nova Compute Nodes. We will do this by using the Manila share as the NFS backing store for Cinder. And so let's begin. All right. Let me go ahead and use the CLI. Let's uh, create a Manila share. We're calling it the boot volumes share. And uh, let me just go ahead and see that the share is created. Yes, it's available. That's where it's created. It's on some host uh, with that huge string out there. Let's go ahead and allow access to a subnet, uh, the, pri the private subnet on this uh, resource. And then let's go ahead and grab the export location for that share. There's the export location. So if you're familiar with using an NFS backend for uh, Cinder, what you would do is grab this, uh, I mean, configure Cinder to run with the same backend and use this share as your, in your NFS shares configuration. So let's go into Cinder. There it is, my NetApp uh, box. It's the same uh, backend that I'm running uh, for Manila. And I'm going to go into the shares config file and paste this particular uh, export path. So what's going to happen is we, we, when we restart Cinder services, we're we expect that Cinder picks up this as the backing store, this uh, Manila share. It takes a uh, second or two for the driver to start up in Cinder. And we can verify that by using Cinder get pools. Get me all the pools that are available for Cinder. I just have one, my Manila share. It's 200 gigabytes. Uh, there it is. It's the same export location that we grabbed, just to prove it to you. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's check whether our volume service is up and running and everything hail and uh, healthy. So there is our volume service. It's enabled, and it's up. Now let's go ahead and boot a Nova instance to a volume on this, it's backed by the Cinder uh, pool that we just have. So we're going to boot to a block device. That's the only Cinder backend I have. So the block device is going to be created on my Manila share. Let's go ahead and uh, watch it being created. Of course, I sped this part up. That's uh, your instance going active. All right. So let's switch to this split screen interface where I'm going to list my uh, this thing, grab the IP of my uh, Nova instance and log into my Nova instance on two separate windows. You'll see why. So just connect to the Nova instance. As you can see, I'm a big fan of clearing the screens. Let's do that. Let's get back uh, into our controller and go ahead and list uh, our share again. Let's see where it is currently. Of course, in your scenario, you're, you're, you're going to be performing some sort of a balancing of your storage system and so on. So you know where you want to go. But I just want to see this is where it is right now. It's on an aggregate called Agar2, which is a Manila pool. Let me go list the li list of available pools. So that's the uh, pool that the share currently is on. I want to move it to another pool. And let me pick the first one. That's my destination. And as this thing, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go ahead and start some workload on our uh, Nova instance. A simple DD command writing some uh, random data into a file. And let's monitor that uh, process as it's happening. So we're just going to list, uh, see some sort of write statistics and, and stuff. So there it is. It's writing something. And let's go back and start a migration. As easy as it, it is to, to do it with the CLI, uh, sorry, the UI, we've made it pretty easy on the CLI as well. So it's all as simple as saying, Panala, start migrating my share to this backend. Right? Take it to this pool. I already know what pool I am on, so take it to this pool. 
So let's go ahead and watch the progress as it does. As you can see, while we started the migration, nothing is happening to the uh, boot volume of Nova that Nova is writing constant data to. Everything is fine. Uh, let's go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry, I skipped the part. We completed the migration. Uh, we, it finished migrate, copying all of your data. There wasn't much data, so it's going to be really fast. So we've started the cutover phase at this point. We expect our Nova instance to crash. I should have practiced this. It's not crashing. All right. And we've moved to a different storage aggregate. What's happening? <laughs> All right, so as you can see, the NOAA instance is unaffected. And your Manila is, share is moved to a different aggregate. All right. Cool. OK, so that wrap, uh, wraps up the main content of our presentation. Before we open up for questions, let's uh, Let's uh, tell you guys about uh, what's coming in our roadmap. So we're going to transition. We plan to transition in the, the replication and migration APIs out of the experimental phase. They are currently fully functional experimental APIs. And uh, this is planned to take place in Okata. Uh, there is also a spec and code proposed for the share backup feature. Uh, which will use the data service to provide a common mechanism of uh, backup functionality to different storage vendors in a similar way that migration does. Uh, but we will also optionally allow uh, storage vendors to, to, to provide their special capabilities and advantages. Uh, also planned in Okata, uh, and uh, we, the one that we just had a design session today, uh, the data service jobs table uh, will allow administrators to monitor uh, what jobs are running in Manila. We also plan on having a, a feature called Share Modify, which will be a user facing API to change several of Manila properties, such as protocol, share type, uh, share network, availability zones. And uh, th this feature, uh, depending on the property change, it may or may not use the, the migration feature to, to move the share between pools. Uh, yeah. So we're also looking to tie up the loose ends in share replication. We are going to fully support the share server's use case, hopefully in the Okata release. And uh, we're going to improve the first party driver support that we have added. We, we, we want uh, users to be able to experience share replication without having uh, you know, any, any proprietary backend on, the, uh, on this thing. Of course, you can do that today, and you can also replicate remote systems, except it's driven by Manila, and that's the part that we want to decouple from Manila. And uh, we are going to be, uh, we're also working for the past couple of releases on, a, uh, on establishing a concept of a group of shares which, uh, upon which some tenants can operate upon. So you could say, okay, group, my, group these shares and then take a snapshot together, or take a consistent snapshot together migrate this group together or replicate this group together and so on. So we'll be continuing that work uh, as well. So that said, we'd like to open for questions. You have uh, mics. OK, there's one mic. Here. Yes. So the demo of live migration, or sorry, the, the, the you can developer call it was really cool. Um, it, I'm wondering if you truly support multiple backends, though, or only the capability to do that with NetApp today. Right. So this this isn't something that's in the code right now. So even NetApp can't do it right now. Not not with Manila, at least. So there are many many vendors that can actually live. Uh, I mean, migrate non-disruptively from their own storage to their own storage, right? So we'd like to expose this functionality through our uh, API, so that administrators, if they know that they're just rebalancing between the same uh, the same vendor and stuff, they can po possibly perform this migration non-disruptively. So this is just one of the prototypes, and this is code that we'd like to commit in the f uh, future releases. Yep, no problem. Anyone else? Yes. It's too far. Okay, <laughs> I can repeat your question. I 
Do we support migrating between different protocols? Not yet. Uh, my, the migration uh, allows changing the properties that are mentioned, that, that are shared type, shared network, uh, uh, consequently uh, sh uh, driver mode and availability zones, but uh, the destination pool has, a has to support the same shared type as the source. So the, the shared type is preserved when it, it is migrated. Maybe I missed this, but can you explain why you had to manually complete the migration? Uh, the, the, the purpose of uh, manually completing the migration is so the administrator can have uh, uh, the best precision in order to uh, minimize downtime. So the administrator can leave uh, overnight copying data, or if he has a database application running, uh, he can pick the right moment to, to trigger complete migration, which should be a very quick operation, and uh, minimize downtime to his application, to his clients that are using the share. That's true, uh, and while non-disruptive operations can actually complete on their own, right? So technically you could kick off the migration and just expect it to complete without, with this level of transparency. We wanted that simplicity to be in the API to allow for a two-phase. So administrators know they're performing a non-disruptive mi migration, but they'd still have control of when to kick off the uh, complete. They could script it if they wanted. Yes. Would it be an option to actually trigger such a migration and have like, ultimate at the end? Yes. So you could possibly write something over Manila. Just use the same uh, uh, API to. But it would be outside of. Outside yes. of Manila. Yes. You can write a script that washes the get progress output, and based on the status, you can no, 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 trigger. No, no, no. What I mean is like, Manila does that. Like, when you like, trigger the migration, it's an option. They actually say, like, when, once you're done, this is the return. No. Oh. Yeah, it's a, that, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. We did consider that, but we have so many different flavors of what this backend engine that, we, that we've built is going to use, that we wanted this two-phase uh, you know, API. It's, it should be really simple to write those two curl commands in one <laughs> script. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you should use the Python Manila client. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, that's Rodrigo, and this is Gautam, and you have your eye. Thank you. Thank you.